Hey YouTube, how's it going? Yak Science here with another biology video. Today we're going to be talking about amino acids. Now, amino acids are essentially the basic building blocks or monomers of proteins. Okay, so just like nucleotides are the monomers, the individual monomers that make up DNA and RNA, so too are amino acids the individual monomers that come together to form proteins. So in this video, we're going to be talking about amino acids in general, the structures of amino acids, uh, similarities and differences you'll see between amino acids, what give different amino acids their unique properties, and how amino acids come together to form peptides. So let's dive in. So first, let's talk about what amino acids typically share. So this is the general structure of an amino acid. By the way, it's called an amino acid because this group right here is called an amino group. Let me write that out. And this group is a carboxylic acid group or a carboxyl group. And since this carboxyl group is acidic, it has an acidic hydrogen, we call this an amino acid. Okay, so that's where the name comes from. And all amino acids that you see will have an amino group and a carboxyl group. Uh, some other things uh, you'll notice is I have drawn a central carbon right here. We call this carbon the alpha carbon. And you'll notice that the alpha carbon is attached to the amino group, the carboxyl group, a hydrogen, which we call the alpha hydrogen, and an R group, which we're going to get to in a second. So this is an alpha hydrogen. And we know that there's no chemical element R. So what this R group represents is actually where the different amino acids will differ from one another, right? All the amino acids will essentially share the same amino group, carboxyl group, uh, alpha hydrogen and alpha carbon, right? They all have those basic elements, but the R group is where they differ. So let's look at some examples. So here I've drawn two common amino acids. One is serine and one is leucine. Now you'll notice that just like we talked about, they share a lot of similarities. We have an amino group right here and right here, right? Let me circle them for you. We have an amino group right there and an amino group right here. You'll notice that we have a carboxyl group right here and a carboxyl group right here. We have our alpha hydrogen right here and right here, our alpha carbons. But notice that they differ in this one region that we called the R group previously. That's here. I'll dot that. So notice that the R group of serine is a CH2OH. It's an alcohol. Whereas the R group of leucine is just made up of hydrocarbons. So that means that these two amino acids, despite their many similarities, will behave very, very differently uh, within a protein, right? So you can imagine that uh, if you have a lot of uh, serine amino acids or other polar amino acids uh, within a protein, those parts of the protein would likely uh, try to get themselves close to water, right? Because they would be hydrophilic. Whereas if you had a lot of amino acids within a protein like leucine, you can imagine that those parts of the protein would want to go inward away from water, assuming that they're in an aqueous environment, right? Because this is a hydrophobic R group and this is a hydrophilic R group. And so a major takeaway from this video is that despite the similarities that we see between the amino acids, right? The amino groups, the carboxyl groups, the, the alpha hydrogen, the alpha carbon, despite those similarities, the differences in the R groups account for major, major differences in the way that the amino acids behave within a protein. Uh, as we'll talk about in a later video, these R groups also play a major role in determining the shape of the protein. So next I wanna talk about a really important concept, and that concept is the Zwitter ion. Zwitter ion is a term that'll probably be tossed around a lot in your biology or biochemistry course, uh, and it's really important that we spend some time to talk about it. So. First, I want to redraw the basic structure of an, of an amino acid that we drew in the beginning of the video. All right, so here it is. Uh, if you'll recall, amino group, carboxyl group, alpha carbon, alpha hydrogen, and R group. So despite the fact that this is a common way for textbooks to present the basic structure, the basic form of, of an amino acid, it turns out that within the human body, under physiological conditions, the form of amino acids will be slightly different. What do we mean by that? We know that amino acids are very, very pH sensitive. And the pH uh, within our blood, within our bodies, uh, ranges roughly from 7.2 to 7.4. And within this pH range, uh, the amino acid will look a little bit different. What will happen uh, at this pH is the following. This acid 
will actually be deprotonated. So this H, right, this acidic hydrogen, goes bye-bye, and you get a negative charge, formal, formal negative charge on the carboxyl group. And in turn, this amino group, with its lone pair on the nitrogen, will be protonated. And so instead of NH2, you get NH3, and that will give the nitrogen a formal charge of positive one, of plus one. So notice that overall, the amino acid still remains neutral, right? A positive and a negative. But this is what we call the Zwitter ionic form of amino acids. And it's the form that the amino acids typically take, in, uh, take under physiological conditions. It's also important to note that the R group too, depending on what the R group is, can be protonated or deprotonated at different pHs. And the last concept that I want to cover in this video is peptide formation. A peptide refers to two or more amino acids that are joined together by a type of bond that we call a peptide bond. So I just want to talk a little bit about how a peptide forms. All right, so I've drawn two amino acids here, and I want to talk about how they, these two can bond together via a peptide bond to form what would then become a dipeptide. Three amino acids would be a tripeptide, etc. And notice also I didn't draw them in the Zwitter ionic form. That's just for simplicity purposes, but now you know what a Zwitter ion is. So, how do these two come together? Well, it starts with this nucleophilic nitrogen attacking or bonding to this carbon molecule. And I'm going to save you uh, the arrow pushing mechanism. We could talk about that in a different video. But essentially, the main takeaway, at least for an introductory purpose, is the following. Upon that attack, you eventually lose this. Notice what I circled is an OH and an H. You're going to lose the OH from the carboxyl group and one H from the amino group. And what is OH? H, another way to say that is H2O, or water. So essentially, you're going to be losing a water molecule when you form a peptide. And that's why we call this type of reaction a condensation reaction. So what are our products going to look like? Well, we know that we're going to lose water. So I'm going to right H2O here, we're losing water, and what we're forming is a dipeptide, right? So here we have a dipeptide. We have this amino acid bonded between the carboxyl carbon of the first amino acid and the amino nitrogen of the other amino acid. There's a bond between these two right here. So the peptide bond happened right over here, okay? And notice that the OH of the carboxyl group is gone, and one of the H's of the nitrogen uh, is gone. And one last thing before we end the video, in any dipeptide or tripeptide, or even if you take it to hundreds, thousands of amino acids connected together, you will have two ends of that long strand of amino acids. An end with an amino, amino group and an end with a carboxyl group. And that's why we say that there are two termini uh, of any peptide. So we call this the N terminus because it's an amino group at the end, and we call this the C terminus. So that's an introduction to amino acid structure. Uh, I hope you found that helpful, and thanks for watching.